Uh, today is Easter, and I don't know if you know this or not, probably because you're here, but around the world, um, I mean, literally almost every tribe, tongue, and language, Easter's an extraordinarily big deal to the Christians there um, because it's the reason we celebrate on Sundays. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but like we don't celebrate on the Sabbath anymore, which is what was done for thousands of years. Um, we actually celebrate, the, the early church said, let's celebrate on the first day of the week, which was Sunday. And they said, let's, because this is when the, our Lord rose. And so they were like, this is what we should do to signify us as Christ followers is to, to meet on, and, and worship together on Sunday. So that's why we're here. And I love just kind of tying in some of the tradition and heritage and history of our, of our Christianity to just knowing that not only does it happening all over the world right now over this weekend, but um, it's, it's something we've been doing for years. And I, this is one of my favorite verses to read on Easter. Uh, this, is, this is me getting a little traditional on you. I read this every single year, uh, but it is the morning, Sunday morning, right? From Matthew 28, early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. And it said, suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord had come down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. And it goes on to say that the guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. So the angel spoke to the woman, don't be afraid, she said, I know you're looking for Jesus, who was crucified. And the angel says, he isn't here. You heard the, <laughs> Courtney read it this morning, he isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen, all right? Now, there's this really cool church, traditional church thing that, you know, if you grew up in church, you, you know what's going on here. I'm going to say the word, Jesus is risen, and you say, isn't that fun, all right? Isn't that fun? That's, that's just a great little, you know, kind of traditional church feel where we get to say, Jesus is risen, and respond with, and you never know when I'm going to pull that out today, so y'all be on your toes, okay, all right? Jesus is risen. There you go. See, I can't, I can't do that any other week. This is amazing. This is the best, best part of that. Um, hopefully, now just to kind of bring it up to speed, hopefully you have enjoyed as much as I have the 21 days of prayer uh, that we've been doing as a church leading up to Easter. And if you haven't been able to take advantage of that, I, that's no problem. But man, it's been a really awesome, sweet time um, kind of walking through today's the end of that 21 days of prayer, and we had our 21 days of prayer journals that we've been doing as a church and individually. Um, we've been having uh, our prayer services on Wednesday afternoon. We had our social media kind of prayer prompts every single day. Uh, we had an amazing experience now with Love Life downtown with, with a prayer walk this uh, this last 21 days. Uh, this past week, Vermont Day Thursday, we had an amazing night of worship. Like, if you couldn't make that all. Oh, you missed an incredible night of worship, and we had some real, all the cool elements that uh, we just can't normally do on a Sunday. It was just really special, and uh, kind of leading us, again, just leading us into this time to celebrate the resurrection. And so I've really, really loved it. Even though the series is about prayer, we've been using, kind of again, walking towards Easter, we've been using Jesus as the example. Like, what, is, what could Jesus teach us in terms of how he prayed, how he taught us to pray, his life of prayer to help us, you know, get better at it or at least make it a, a part of our life or at least understand prayer better in terms of why it was given to us as this incredible gift to communicate with God. So let me just do a real quick recap because this is what we've already gone through. But we've talked about prayer, that the purpose of prayer, Pastor Shin started us off talking about the purpose of prayer is to glorify God. That when Jesus taught us how to pray, you know, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When he taught us the Lord's Prayer, uh, it really was just all about God. And it was all about kind of glorifying him in every aspect of how we pray. The next week I talked about the practice. You know, the spiritual practice and engagement of prayer really is for the purpose to align our hearts with his heart and to help us walk in the authority of God. And we, we talked about Jesus in his, in his humanity and, you know, fully God, fully man, that in his humanity, he still had to get away and pray. He had to get away and keep himself connected to the Father. Last week, we talked about the difficult tension 
the paradox that we come to in prayer, and I hopefully you've experienced this, where you, you really are living in the tension of being able to approach the throne of grace boldly. You're able to approach with confidence that God can and will and is able to do all things even beyond what we can ask or imagine. But we also hold in our same hands the uncertainty that God will or won't do something that we're praying for. But, you know, that God's answer, he answers every prayer, but sometimes his answer is no, right? That, 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 that is not always our answer. So we walk in humility, we walk in the uncertainty of not knowing God's greater plan, his greater will, and yet it's not supposed to keep us from believing for the miraculous or asking for the impossible. And so today it brings us to, well, I've been really excited about this, I want to uh, talk about uh, some specific prayers that Jesus made while he was on the cross. But this is John. This is how John described our gift of prayer in terms of approaching God. He said, the confidence that we get to have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, if we ask anything according to his will, that he hears us. Right? They just sang this song about the throne room of God, and we've talked about the fact that that is where our prayers go. That's where they land. That's where they end up. Like That's, that's a miracle in and of itself, that, that our prayers reach heaven. We can, we can you know, lean in and, and call upon heaven, and heaven hears us, and it's just beautiful. And that's the confidence we're supposed to have going into this understanding of prayer. And so, Jesus makes several statements, hear the words, statements while he's hanging on the cross. And, and we're going to not look at every single statement, but we are going to look at three prayers, okay? Three prayers that he makes very specifically on the cross from the Gospels, all right? These are the Jesus' three prayers on the cross. Let's walk through them. This comes from Luke 23. It says, when he came to a place called the skull, this is walking up to the Calvary, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals uh, were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said this, and you know what, this is a good practice. Let's just, let's just read Jesus' prayer out loud together, so every time you see the yellow, just read it along with me, all right? So Jesus said, let's read it together, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And then the sol soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. One of the favorite things about this prayer for me is just the fact that, that even in the agony and in the suffering and in the pain of the death that Jesus was going to experience, that one of the first things that he, he does is he continues to see through a lens of grace you and me and the people that were in front of him that day. I mean, the guys are casting lots and literally gambling for his clothes because, you know, he, has, he no longer has rights, he no longer has anything, he's going to die. And, and he's looking at the people who have cheered for him to be crucified. And he prays to God with grace. Father, they don't get it. They don't see it. They're still so deceived by their religion. They're so, still so deceived by the world. They're still so deceived by the enemy. Like, they can't see it. And so God, don't, if he was literally saying, God, don't hold it against them. Like, forgive them for killing your son. Beautiful. Here's another prayer. This is in Matthew's gospel. He says, this is around the same time. At noon, darkness fell on the whole land until about 3 o'clock. And the gospels record kind of how the day kind of unfolded. But around 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama, uh, sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now, there's some big theological stuff here. I can't unpack all of it. But to keep it simple... You know, Jesus was never separated from the Father before or since. That the Trinity itself, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, have a, uh, you know, a, 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 an everlasting union and communion with each other. And that theologically we understand that, that there was a moment that the Bible tells us that all of the sin, past, present, and future, were sort of given and laid on top of Christ so that he could pay the price, because he was the only one worthy. Revelation tells us that. He's the only one worthy to open the scroll, the lamb that had been slaughtered. So Jesus was the only one worthy to do that. So there's a moment at which 
the best we can tell is that God sort of had to separate. There had to be this, this gap because God is not the author or can be you know, associated with sin. And so all of the sin is laid upon the Son. And in that moment, he's heartbroken. Again, his humanity and his divinity are both seen here. God, why have you, another translation says, forsaken me? Here's another one. This is the third one. Same thing, but from Luke's point of uh, Luke's account. Again, about noon, the darkness fell, whole land until three o'clock. And the light from the sun was gone. The curtain from the sanctuary in the temple, the veil, was torn down the middle. Another translation tells you that it was torn from top to bottom. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies, God from man, was torn. And Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. Along with that prayer is the declaration. John's gospel tells us, he says, it is finished. And again, that's a declaration for us and for people to understand like he had, he had accomplished what God sent him to do. It is finished. But I love the fact that this prayer is recorded, that he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Why does he say that? Well, because again, Jesus understood that we are everlasting beings. We are created to be an everlasting, we're going to live forever, okay? Uh, and, the, and the issue is not our body. We all know, especially if you're older, our bodies aren't going to make it, right? Like our bodies aren't going to make it. Like I can feel it right now. My body's not going to make it, right? So it's like we get that our body is not that, but he says, no, 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 our spirit will continue. And so he doesn't say, I give you my, my, my life or my, my body. He says, I'm entrusting my spirit, God, to you, only you. I can put my life, my eternal life in your hands. And again, I think all of that is just for a picture for us. And what, I, what I've loved about these prayers in terms of what we learn and what Jesus teaches us, what we, can, what we can learn from what Jesus teaches us is that the posture of prayer, how do we come to God? Well, the posture of prayer is surrender. It's a surrender. Like G, every one of these prayers is a posture of surrender. He was submitting to the Father's will. God, why have you forsaken me? Like, we're submitting to your will. You know, don't, don't God, don't put this against them for doing this. Like, you know, forgive them. God, I entrust you alone with my eternity, with what's going to happen. And this is Jesus' posture of surrender, which God baked right into our practice of prayer. And again, you know, this has all been done. This again, church history. You can look at all the, the church history and see some really cool aspects of how we've seen this play out in terms of why prayer brings about this, this posture, so to speak, of surrender. How many, I'm going to age everybody here for just a minute, <coughs> or at least, you know, see if you've been to any museums. How many of you ever went to a church, okay, an old church? Think about like an ancient church. You went to an old church and, you, and they had pews, big hard wooden, you know, pews, right? And then they had this really cool like footrest in front of you. You guys know what I'm talking about? You know, they had this little footrest that moved, right? But it wasn't a footrest, was it? What's it for? Yeah, why? Because this is the posture of prayer. <laughs> because God baked in this idea that, hey, that surrender is such a big deal to us in terms of prayer in terms of our posture, that he physically, there's so much example of physically kneeling in prayer was a good idea for us to kind of get used to. Now, I'm really thankful. I mean, you know, I, I'm thankful for the deacons meeting where they were like, we got to put some pads on those things. You know, like, like I'm thankful that, that uh, they had some pads on those uh, kneelers, so to speak, for prayer. Now, again, I don't think God is as fixated, if you will, on our physical posture as much as he is concerned about our heart's posture, the posture of what we bring to him in terms of our attitude and our heart. Why? See, I think God knew this about humanity. God obviously knew this about us. That baked into humanity is this, uh, psychologists actually call this the illusion of control bias, okay? Okay baked right in, and now theologically we can look at it and say, well, we know that's our sin, that's our sin nature. But, but you know, psycho, you know even, even psychologists say 
oh, you know, all of humankind to a certain degree has this illusion of control bias that we simply think that we can control our destiny. That we can, if we work hard enough and if we're smart enough, and if we, you know, we, you know, can press through it and whatever case, like we can figure it out. We can really control the outcome of things. We can control our lives and our destiny. And every single one of us is sort of, so to speak, cursed with that bias, that natural bias in us. So God knew that he was going to have to put into this, this practice of prayer, this posture to help us understand that we actually don't control everything. But that's, again, it's an illusion of control. Something beautiful happens when we come in to a, when a, with a posture of surrender. And, and this is what happens. And this is what we talk about at our church. This, this posture of surrender activates hope. Like it activates hope in us. Now, people have asked me before when we talk about, you know, you've seen our sign out there, uh, hopefully coming in. We exist to humbly point everyone to absolute hope. That's our mission as a church. But it's like, it's more than that. Where does hope come from? Well, yeah, hope is belief. Yeah, hope is this, you know. But when we talk about hope, absolute hope, we're talking about the fact that, that our trust and our hope and our faith are tied to something larger than ourselves. Like it's, it's bigger than us. And so something happens when we come to him in a posture of surrender. Because we're surrendering our hearts to his. We're surrendering, we're surrendering, and we're putting our lives in his very capable hands, right? He's not going to let us down. We put our lives in his hands, and something happens to us. We actually are infused with hope. We actually can start to believe that all things are possible because of God. All things can happen because of God. All things beyond what we can ask or imagine are because of God. So there's just something incredible that happens when we come in this posture of surrender is that we actually can, can have more hope and more faith than anyone else around us because we're actually surrendering to him. Now, very quickly, before I, I, I go to the next scripture, because we are going to talk about how the resurrection plays into this, but I have to tell you, there's a difference, okay? There's a difference between surrender as it's properly, we're trying, trying to use it properly. There's a difference in the, in, the, in the idea of surrender versus giving up, okay? Because surrender, the true idea of surrender, brings and activates hope into our life. But what usually happens for most of us is that, we, we, we will, because again, this illusion of control bias, I mean, we will try and we will try and we will try and we will try. We'll try to fix it. We'll try to repair it. We'll try to manipulate it. We'll try to navigate it. We'll try to work it out. We'll try to make it work, right? And we will do everything in our power and other people's power to accomplish and get it done and to control the outcome. And what ends up happening is that, and it goes a couple different directions, is that we end up just giving up. And, and you, another good word for that is we resign to that. Like we, 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 we give up or give in to the circumstances. We feel overwhelmed by the circumstances. We give in to our trouble. We give in to our problems. We give, we give up on a solution. And what, what comes when you give up? Despair, right? Anxiety, frustration, hopelessness is what comes from that. Does everybody understand the difference? That's so much different than a heart of surrender. That, that giving up, that giving up is, is completely tied to this idea that we were supposed to be able to control it and we couldn't. So I'm a failure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a failure. And guys, this is one of the reasons we're one of the most medicated people in the world. Because we were sold. We were sold by our culture that this, this illusion of control was real. And that, you know what, you, you know, if you, if you feel out of control, it's, you're wrong. Like, it's wrong. It's bad. Like, when you start feeling out of control and that things are off the rails, you know, everything around us tells us, like, oh, that's horrible. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And yet, we have been given this practice and this engagement of prayer to help align our hearts with God's and be able to come in a posture of surrender and just go, hey, guess what? Newsflash, I wasn't meant to control my, this universe. I can't control anything. Like, God, your, your universe is what matters. 
So there's a difference between giving up and control. Understand this. Jesus was never not in control when he was on the cross. Right? He wasn't not in control. Scripture tells us he could have called a billion angels down and wiped everybody out. He could have. But he didn't. Why? Because his prayers weren't all about controlling things. His prayers were surrender. Remember last week we prayed, if this cup can pass from me, God, let it pass from me. Well, when he was on the cross, he was pretty clear that wasn't going to happen, right? So what was his heart? Your will be done. His heart was a heart of surrender to God's will. So there's a big difference, guys, in this giving up. Now, I will say, God can use the person who hits rock bottom, who does give up, even though they have to go through the despair and they have to go through the hopelessness, if they turn to him, if they shift to him, if they bring that give up to him into surrender, he will infuse and activate hope into their life. Does that make sense? Like that's, that's what he does. That's, that is what the power of God does through prayer. Here's how it ties to the resurrection. This is how Paul wanted to kind of share it with the, with the church in Corinth. He, 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 I mean, he hinges everything on this event that changed history and changes people's future. He said, if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless. Good job, Matt. Find a new job. All right? Your faith is useless, right? This hope and faith you have is, is, is nothing. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is useless, and you're still all guilty of your sins. Okay, good luck, right? Good luck. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost, and then he makes this statement. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are to be pitied more than anyone in the world. This is Paul's way of basically saying, like, look, if you're tacking on Jesus just to help make your life better, like if, if you're going to tack on Jesus to be like this religious thing that comes in and, and it's only about the here and now, it's only in the moment that matters, good luck. We are to be pitied more than anybody else. Because that is not where our hope comes from. That's not what our hope is even tied to. And people have asked, like, well, how, how do we know the, the difference? How do we know what's happening? Well, I, I, this is a great example I like to give people sometimes. This, and don't, this won't tell on yourself, but you guys remember this thing? <laughs> a good way to know... A good way to know that you are still kind of approaching prayer while you're tied to this illusion of control is to base all of the ideas of how God answers your prayers on the outcomes you see immediately, right? So, some, I mean, listen, some people approach prayer this way. I mean, you know, I got a business deal that's hanging in the balance today. I mean, God, I, you know, it, it's got to go the way I need it to go. And you just, you work all day and pray and work all day and pray. And you're just like, boy, it's got to go the right way. It's got to go the right way, Lord. And all of a sudden, ooh, outcome looks good. Right? All signs point to yes. And sometimes there's, there's times where you need the miracle, right? You need the quick miracle. You need the, you know, uh, all the, 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 the money ran out, but the month is still here. You guys all know that feeling, right? And, and you need God to step in and do something, you know, manifest some dough, in the old account, you know, so you're praying, 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 praying. I don't know how we're going to figure this out. I don't know how we're going to make it. What's it look like? How are we going to do it? Let's see here. This thing's hard to read sometimes. Uh, reply hazy. Well, that's good to know. All right. <laughs> My favorite is when we just, we bring God options. You ever done that? You know, you ever done that? Like, Hey, God, I got this job and this job I'm looking at. Which one do you want me to take? Hey, God, there's this girl and this girl I'm looking at. You know, which, one, which, which one's going to break my heart? Which one's going to, you know, make me love, be in love forever? Uh, God, you know, we always give God two options, you know, like, like, uh, like the old ephod in the Old Testament, you know. But we bring, it, we bring it to God. We're like, okay, God, okay, okay, let's go. What are we going to do? Is it this one or this one? Ask again later. There we go. And the reason I say that is because you could tell probably very quickly in your prayer life and the way you approach God, are you really coming to him 
knees bent in your heart, surrendering your throne of your kingdom so that you can be a part of his kingdom? Kind of giving up in the right way this illusion of control over your universe so that you can be tied and get strength from the, the master and controller of this universe? When we approach it like the magic eight ball, we're just, we're just constantly looking for God to like, it's that old prayer I said a few weeks ago, like, God, I need you to be useful to me today. I need you to be available to me today when I need you. I need, I, you know, and it's like, that's not, the prayer of surrender comes in and says, God, it's not for this life, okay? It's not just for this life. I mean, my, my life is tied to you. My, my, life is, my life is in your very capable hands, and, 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 pr- and prayer for me and for you ought to be this natural thing that happens so often and so much in our life that it's this rhythm of constantly bringing, constantly in the right way, surrendering us and humbling us so that when we're praying to God, we know exactly who we are and we know exactly who he is. And why does that matter? Because it brings us hope. That's what actually activates hope in our hearts. Here's how Paul challenged and encouraged the church. He said, he said this to the church in Rome. He said, rejoice in our confident hope, our absolute hope. That's where we get that word in the scripture where it says confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. The ESV actually says, be constant in prayer. Constant is not like never ending. We're not monks, you know, in a, in, you know, stuck in some old castle somewhere just praying all day long, chanting. No, constant is prayer. It's just like we don't give up. It's not haphazard. It's not it's not just, you know, when you're feeling like it. It's like it's a, it's a rhythm of it's the same way you eat and sleep and go to work and do your thing. Like prayer is this continual thing that is supposed to be constant in your life because he knows that's what activates hope in you. Keep going. This is what he said to the church in uh, uh, Ephesus. He says, I want you to pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I mean, I love that passage of interceding for all believers everywhere, but I love, I love the fact that Paul's just like, look, he's basically trying to say there's no, there's, no, there's no place or no time that is ever off limits to be in prayer, right? Like all times and all places is pretty, I mean, by the way, the Greek is all, right? All times and all places means that, the, I mean, and you see it in Scripture, right? It's like on the mountainside and in the belly of a whale, right? Like it's, it's yeah, there's no place you're not supposed to be praying, like that's, it's supposed to be that part of your life where no place is really off limits. I think I shared a couple weeks ago, like my truck, uh, the, my car, my truck has become kind of that place for me. Like I just, I find myself not listening to the radio as much and, you know, I have shorter distances to drive and I just find myself like in conversations with God in my car because that just seems to be the place where I'm least distracted. I mean, I hate to say that about driving, but I'm the least distracted. I'm not having constant text and calls and solving problems. Like I'm just, I'm just driving. And I have some great conversations there. This is the next one. He says, rejoice. This is uh, Thessalonica. He says, rejoice always, pray continually. This is where you get that King James says, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all thir- circumstances for this is God's will in Christ Jesus. Now, this I learned this from my mom. This is, uh, this is something that my mom was a great example of in my life. She used to say it to me in those words, like pray without ceasing was such a big deal. And she would say, uh, say that to me. She'd be like, you know, this is, you know, she's in this ever sort of constant, never ending conversation with God all day long, right? Like that's just how she does it. Like I've never, I never, I never had to see my mom like carve out a time to pray because she was just always kind of talking to God. She was always kind of just in the moment. Now she's 83 now, right? So I mean, I know she gets up in the morning. She's like, woohoo, I'm alive. You know, like, hey God, what's up? And then, you know, she kind of goes throughout her day. And I've literally seen her, you know, she'll crochet something or she'll be, and she'll be thinking about something or just talking to God and God will give her something for something she wants to write in a card or, you know, for one of her talks, she'll, she'll write it down and she'll be like, oh, thank you, God. Thank you for that. And, and I'm just telling you, it's this, it's this never-ending, preoccupied, if you will, conversation with God. It's beautiful. I mean, it's the most beautiful example I've ever seen in my life of just how that is lived out. And I, again, I know that's all, all these things are the way Paul describes helps us move into that place of surrender, helps us activate the hope 
that we have when we submit ourselves to him, when we surrender ourselves to him. This is where the power comes in. Now, I did have to give you this one. This is the, the last thing I'm going to give you before we head out today, but it, it's, it's, the, it's the fifth element in perspective of prayer. It's the power of prayer. And I know this is going to seem a little elementary, but the power of prayer is Jesus Christ. And again, I know that seems very like, uh, no duh, you know, kind of thing. And that's because you're all very smart church people because you come here. Okay, so I, just, I understand that. But here, here's what I want you to see. This is a conversation. These are some questions that came in. We were talking about power and you know, all that kind of thing. We were, I was talking to one partner about uh, why we pray in Jesus' name because, you know, we were talking about do we pray to Jesus? Do we, do we pray to him because he intercedes to God? Do we pray to the Holy Spirit who lives inside us? Do we pray to God the Father? And I'm like, you know what? You just do whatever you got to do. You know, like pray to all. They're all God. They're agreed. They're all God. You pray to whoever you want. That's fine. I, you can meet with me in a long prayer session. I'm, I'm naming all of them, right? Like, Holy Spirit, do this. Jesus, you understand that. God, help here, you know. I'm going to pray to all of them. But the power comes because what we've been told is that if we ask it in Jesus' name, that's where the power comes from, right? Like, it's not, it's not, it's not a sign-off. Let me just help everybody understand that. Praying in Jesus' name isn't like an over and out, good buddy, catch you on the flip side, you know? That's not what, that's not what the end of your prayer is doing. The end of your prayer is saying is that of all the things, God, we just talked about, I only have the ability to do that because of you, Jesus Christ. I only have the ability and the pathway to God in Jesus' name which is why that's where the power is. Now, here's, here's the one we're going to read together. This is Matthew 28. Uh, go ahead and open up your Bible or your Bible app. Um, we're going to start and read these few verses together. This is Matthew 28, verse 16. <laughs> uh, this is the Great Commission, but I want to read these few verses ahead of time because I just, I just love these verses. I can't not read them when I see them. Starting in verse 16, it says, the 11 disciples, right, no, no Judas, they went to Galilee, up to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. They've already seen Jesus resurrected, you know, he's told them where to go and meet up before his ascension. And I love this, it says that when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some of them doubted, okay? Now just get your brain around that for a minute, Okay? Have you ever had anybody in your life just say, you know what, if Jesus would just talk to me, if he would just say something to me, I would do it. You know what you can say to them? Liar. <laughs> you know? Why? Because people saw a resurrected Jesus and went, oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay? So just call it out. Like, just call it out. That's just the way it is. We know that's true. So here it is. It says they, that some of them saw him and doubted, but, but when they saw him, they, the disciples worshiped. Then he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey my commands or all the commands I have given you. And be sure that I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now we can see, you know, there's, there's a lot of cool pictures in Revelation that kind of help us understand that there was some theme to this story that, that even though Jesus is God and it's all part of the Trinity, that God was weaving in for our benefit this, this fully God, fully human uh, sacrifice of Christ and that because of the sacrifice Jesus made, that he is now the name above all names. He is now the King of kings and Lord of lords. We see in Revelation that there's no one higher than him. Like There's just this, this role, so to speak, that, that we have. And we see that Jesus is like, you know, I think Courtney said it, like when he conquered death, like, you know, it became all about his name and it all became about him. So this is where the power comes from. And the reason I want you to hear this is, listen, there are, there are denominations and there are, uh, you know, theological, you know, people that are trying to, I mean, they're selling online courses and taking people through spiritual schooling to how to have a powerful prayer life, to how to, you know, how to, how to sort of amp up your prayers and how to get your prayers answered. And I just want you to hear it from your pastor. Like, there's no power in what you do in prayer, okay? There's no formula there's no, I don't care if you're sitting on your head or spinning around or I don't, 
I don't care if you have a prayer language. Like, it doesn't matter. The power does not come from you or me. The power of prayer is in Jesus Christ. Because all authority and all power is his. It ain't about you figuring out how to do it better. Now, do we, do we want to pray better, you know, engage and learn and do? Yeah, that's why we're doing the series. But don't hear it from us that, like, we just trying to, we're trying to get your prayer life a little bit better so you can start sort of, you know, experiencing more answered prayer. No, that's not it. We just know that you're, you're invited to pray so that you can experience the power of God in your life because of who Jesus is. Here's how Paul said it to the church in Ephesus, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let you start, just see how many times he talks about this idea of the power of God as he prays for the church. He prays that we would see and experience this power because of who Jesus is. Here's how Paul says in Ephesians 3.14, he says, when I think of all this, I fall on my knees and pray. I pray to Father, the creator of all things in heaven and on earth. And he goes on to say, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, that he will empower you. Okay, he'll empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Christ will make his home in your hearts and you'll trust in him. Your roots will grow down deep in God's love and keep you strong. That you may have the power to understand. That you may actually have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. And that you may experience the love of Christ Though it's too great to understand fully, then you'll, be able to make, then you'll be made complete with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. How does that happen? It comes because we can't fully understand, like, we can't get all of God in us, but all of God fills us. Does that make sense? Like, that's the way it's being explained. We'll ex- we get to experience the fullness of life and power because of what Christ has done from God. And so here's how he says it again. All glory to God who is able through his mighty power that's at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. Translations say ask or imagine. Glory to him in the church. Why? Because the purpose of prayer is to glorify God and in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's just one prayer where Paul is looking at the church of Ephesus and he's saying, he said, when, look, when I consider all this, and he was basically saying, when I consider the mystery of God revealed, that, 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 that he's going to save the Jew and the Gentile, and he's going to use us broken people, he's like, well, he's going to use us to, to magnify and point people to Jesus Christ. When I consider all that, I pray for you. Why? So that you can experience, he, you can be empowered, you can have the power to understand, you can have his power at work in the fullness of life in you, and that through his power at work in you and then through Christ, you can accomplish what he's called you to accomplish. I mean, nothing, we're going to give you the quick list here. Nothing really accomplishes all these things until you see a prayer like that. And probably that prayer took two minutes for Paul. I mean, like, it, it, and it accomplishes all of it. And again, there, guys, there is no formula. We gave this to you, by the way. It's on the back of your scripture cards. We just wanted you to have it. Again, this is not an outline. This isn't a formula. This, this is just reminders. Just let it be in a place to remind you of the purpose of prayer and the paradox that we face and the, and the practice we should be in and the surrendered posture and, and, and the power that comes because of who Christ is. I'm going to ask, the, I ask the, our uh, Shin and our vocalist to come back up. We had an amazing, just beautiful worship night the other night on Thursday night, and we closed the night out with a song, and I just said, hey, look, just based off of where we are in this series and based off the sermon, like, I really think this would be a great way to close Easter. And so uh, we, we are going to give you some closing announcements and stuff, but before we do that, kind of as we end, I've just decided, I will pray for us in a minute, but I've decided I want this song to sort of be our prayer, Okay. I want this to be our prayer. I want the words of the song to sort of just be in, a, be in a posture of surrendered prayer to God as we sing this song and speak the name of Jesus 
over our lives and over this church and over our community and over our families. I just want us to have this time that really kind of brings home this idea of the power of God and the power of prayer is resting in Jesus Christ. So feel free to sing the words. I want everybody to stand, but sing the words or if you want to just hold your hands open to receive what God might have you receive. Let our vocalist lead you and let's engage in this song and then I'll come up and pray for us and lead us in a, in a short prayer as well. But I really want this song to be kind of our, our heart of prayer this morning. Let's sing. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every strong. I'm going to take a minute just to pray before we continue to sing the rest of the song, but uh, I can't take for granted on Easter in a room this size that everyone here has made the choice to surrender li their life to Christ. Um, and so I'm not going to make you raise your hand or walk an aisle this morning because I do want this to, to continue to be a heart of prayer. But, but before we sing the name of Jesus over our lives, I just want every life to be included in this room. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray a prayer with you and for you that you can pray with me. That if you've never, never taken that step of faith, you can do it today. Let's pray together. And if it's you, just, just say these words in your heart. Again, this is all about the posture of your heart. As you say, Jesus, I... I think I understand today maybe differently than I have before that the price you paid on the cross was for me and my sin. And that the reason you rose again was so that I could experience life in you. And so God, I just want to give my heart to you. Jesus, save me. 
I can't do it on my own. If you've prayed that prayer, I just pray that you will find a church or this church or God, we're just praying as a church together that those who prayed this prayer will have an opportunity to grow in their faith, ask the questions they need to ask, that there's no questions that are bad questions. There's no, they, they, there's people that love them and would love to help them walk in this new life of faith. And God, for the rest of us, as we get ready to sing these words, we just, we just speak your powerful and precious and holy name over our lives, over the city, over our community. Because we entrust our spirit and our lives in your hands. Amen. Let's continue to sing this song together. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Oh, Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, but Jesus for my speak your name over our families, over our hearts, over our community, over this nation, over this world. For your name is powerful. For your name is freedom. For your name brings what's in the dark out into the light. So we trust in that wonderful, powerful, and beautiful name of Jesus. God, we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray.